Hello and welcome back to the From My Perspective podcast, where I, Jackson McCarty, tell you all the names you need to know in the college football and NFL landscapes that could be changing the football landscape in the very near future. Now, college football season is fastly approaching. It's coming at us quick, and there's a lot of things to know, but none more important, perhaps, than thinking about who the potential Heisman candidate could be, or who the Heisman candidates in totality could be, and who are the favorites to win it. So that's exactly what I want to talk about today. This is entirely my list of guys that I'm keeping an eye on. There could be a thousand different players that rise up from the ranks, could even end up becoming the Heisman. But I, I'm going to single it down to 10 for today, focus on the primary candidates for me and who I will be watching, especially at the very beginning of the season. So number 10, it's it's already hard enough for me to identify wide receivers as Heisman candidates. I do think Jackson Smith and Jigba from Ohio State is really good, but it's not good enough uh, he is very much a very talented player, and he could end up in the Heisman conversations. But since his position is so quarterback dependent, like he can't throw himself the ball, he comes in at number 10 for me. And a lot of intrigue for me comes from the fact that he will be wide receiver one this year instead of two or three. I really, you could argue where he fell behind Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. But getting that designation is both a gift and a curse. While, yes, you will more likely than not be getting more targets, you're also going to get more coverage and more focus in coverage. You know, whenever Ohio State, if they were to have played uh, Clemson, Andrew Booth wouldn't have been on Jackson Smith and Jigba. And you know what I mean by that. The cornerback ones weren't typically on JSN. They had to focus on other receivers. Now they will be, and he is going to be the primary focus in the receiving room for that offense. And ultimately... Again, I think the position is pretty heavily um, dependent and just uh, it's hard to predict a wide receiver having a Heisman type year because it's not very common that we see that. I know Devonta Smith is the most recent example, but it's, you know, it's easy to kind of get lost in the shuffle, especially if you have a quarterback that's really high up on the Heisman ranks. It almost feels like a surplus, like you've you've done too much to promote the offense or, you know, you're giving too much credit to two people in the offense so it, it gets a little bit dicey there. So Jackson Smith and Jigba leads off a list that will pri- be primarily dominated by quarterbacks. The next uh, next candidate I want to talk about fits that bill. We've got Will Levis from the University of Kentucky. The reason I'm focusing on Will Levis is because he is the ultimate make or break prospect in college football this year. He could end up leading Kentucky to 10 wins and developing into a very high ceiling, especially uh, through my eyes. I think that he could be a very talented quarterback, but he could also end up going 500, not perform quite to the levels that some people are projecting him, myself kind of included. I've fallen a little bit off the bandwagon, uh, just a hair, but I, I still do believe that he'll be a very talented quarterback. I just don't know if it'll end up being Heisman levels. I can't leave him off, though, because of the the peak of his athletic abilities are very much within the realm of Heisman contention. Kentucky as a whole, I think, is a really uncertain team, and that's very reflective within the fact that Will Levis is on this list, despite the fact that he's almost kind of not. It's very, it's, it's almost like a coin flip this year. It, you really have no clue what to expect going into it. Uh, I think they're one of the harder teams to predict, and having a player that it will be the most forthright or most you know focused upon player for their team in the Heisman race but so low down because it is so up in the air I think that really uh, exemplifies what Kentucky is as a team this year another team that I believe will be very up in the air depending on how chemistries work depending on how uh, quickly all these new players settle into their new surroundings is the University of Southern California and I've got Caleb Williams coming in next on the Heisman watch Caleb Williams is a very, very talented quarterback. I I don't think anybody can really argue that. Uh, we've seen what he managed to do at Oklahoma. He managed to get we want Caleb chance when Spencer Rattler, who was previously the prized possession of Oklahoma fans, um, or at least the prized prospect and the guy who was going to be that next Heisman quarterback at OU, 
halfway through the season, they were getting We Want Caleb chants, and whenever they got him in there, he delivered. You know, he took uh, he took a hold of that starting job. He was a very good quarterback. Well, now he's moving to a completely new location. He's moving with his old head coach, yes, and he's got a lot of talent around him, but there's no real proof or known commodity that will show that these will all these pieces will all fit together and they're very large pieces for their their previous puzzles but you know the sometimes they just don't work out sometimes a new puzzle cannot be made from these previous uses and Caleb Williams is really kind of at the 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 center of that right now because while quarterbacks are vital to how teams play obviously um, he can't do everything and if they start having disputes, if the defense loses them a couple crucial games, it's going to become a problem. And that's that's something else I'll touch on here in a little bit because um, I, the quarterbacks do get weighed down by team record and team result. Uh, even though wins aren't a quarterback stat, they just primarily get attributed to quarterbacks. Caleb Williams could be a similar player that we see fall into that category. You know, if they go eight and four, but you've got some guys that are, you know, at the very top of this list that I'm projecting on teams that I think will finish with 10 or more wins. It's kind of hard to be like, you know what, we should give this eight and four quarterback the Heisman whenever we've got all these other players, primarily quarterbacks, that are leading higher achieving programs to higher destinations and the college playoffs or New Year's Six Bowl. So it's really hard to imagine where Caleb Williams, unless USC really just hits the ground running and becomes a New Year's Six level team overnight, it's hard to, for me to imagine that the path is all that clear for him to become the Heisman. The next guy, I think, also has a relatively hard time getting to the Heisman, but um, if you paid attention to my top 25 videos uh, that I just was releasing, literally the last three episodes prior to this one, I'm very high on Tennessee's offense, and I'm very high on Hendon Hooker, so he actually comes in above Caleb Williams for me, and I believe that he is a real dark horse for the Heisman potentially this year. If Tennessee's offense fully clicks with Brew McCoy, it might be the best offense in the SEC, which puts them like top five at the minimum for college football as a whole because you're going to have your Alabamas and your Georgias. Well, leave Georgia off that list, but at least your Alabama. If you're a better offense than Alabama is and they've got you know, nine out of 11 starters that are going to be NFL starters at some point in their lives, um, if you can manage to be better than that, You've done very, very well, and you are a certified top five offensive unit in the league. Um, Hendon Hooker is going to be at the forefront of that. Obviously, Brew McCoy's fit, and some of those other pieces that they brought back from last year are going to be very vital. But if you don't got somebody throwing you the rock, then the offense really can't be all that valuable. That's where Hendon Hooker steps in. We know he can do it. He had a touchdown ratio. He had like over 10 touchdowns per one interception last year. He was incredible, and... I, I think that now he's just got more talent around him. So that naturally builds up to a better season, or at least you would assume so in your head. And that leads me to putting him at number seven. It's a little lower than maybe my gut tells me. I could make a case for him being top five. And I during you know making the list for this, I was very close to having him top five, but he ended up getting bumped down partially because of what I talked about with Caleb Williams. Their defense is not the best unit in the world. It's just as likely they win 10 games as they win eight. And it's it's so difficult to predict an individual award based on team success because, you know, that does factor in there. As much as I dislike that, I think it should just go to the best player in college football, regardless of, you know, if he went over for whatever, but he was a superstar. He, you know, he was still super valuable to his team and at the end of the day, he can only control what he can control. It's not, it's not like he's stepping in there and, uh, you know, going out on defense and giving up the the game winning touchdown or whatever. He went out there and did everything he could to make the game work and to put himself in a position to win. If it doesn't work out that way, it's not entirely on the quarterback, which I think is a really weird narrative that has just kind of stuck around now. That quarterback 
all quarterbacks are the reason you win or lose. They're just not. Hendon Hooker, though, could get a bit of that, that old school thought process that gets pushed against him and might find himself on the outside looking in of the Heisman finalist group. So he marks the last quarterback within this little section because we take a little break from the position. We go running back now, and we go to Wisconsin and Braylon Allen, who I really think could be the nation's top running back this year. And just seeing Wisconsin's general uh, build in history and some of the lack of questions at quarter, or not lack of questions, but some of the lack of proof of how good Graham Mertz is going to be, I think you really lean into that run first system. And Braylon Allen came out and you know really announced himself as being a really talented running back and being one of the guys to watch last year. And I think it transitions just fine over to this season. As a freshman in college, he had over 1,200 yards on the ground. Over, say he had a 6.8 yards per carry average, 12 touchdowns. He's not really a threat as a receiver right now, but those pure numbers as a freshman are mind-boggling. And Wisconsin will have the strength of, you know, strength of opponent next year. That if they do finish with a nine or ten win season then you can absolutely justify it. Even if they're not necessarily a New Year's Six or a playoff team, they'll have so much going for them in terms of how well Braylon Allen is going to have to perform for one. To even be a running back in contention, you have to be so good that if he gets to this level, you're, it's you know, it's going to be hard to deny him if his team's nine wins. It's a whole lot easier to say, well, this quarterback had a great season, but his team only won eight than it is for a running back. Um, again, because it's a somewhat dependent position based on your offensive line and play calls and things of that nature. Quarterbacks get a bit more leeway. Um, so if he finds himself in this spot, it's going to be a great deal. And I think that with how Wisconsin is set up for the next year, Braylon Allen should and will most likely be the primary focal point and I projected, I believe, nine wins for them. So if he can come back with another 18, 1900 yard season, which I know is oh, two thirds or one third additionally on top of what he got last year, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, he just went and almost got th- uh, 1300 yards in his freshman year in college. It's entirely possible for him to make that step up. And I'm just kind of waiting to see if he makes it happen. So that takes a little bit of a break from the quarterbacks. We are resuming looking at those now because we go to the University of Miami and we go to Tyler Van Dyke. If last season was any indication of how good he is going to be, and you know, especially at the end of the season there, uh, Tyler Van Dyke will be a potential Heisman finalist, and I think he stays in the race till the very end of it. Miami not being up to the same level as other teams are here, um, Again, a a very similar thing with Hendon, Hooker, and Caleb Williams. I think that he could have a phenomenal season, but the guys above him are all potentially on playoff teams or are not quarterbacks. You know, there's a couple there that fall into both of those, but um, it's it's hard to imagine a quarterback that doesn't at least go New Year's Six winning the Heisman for me. I just, I don't see it as a feasible thing, but... A lot of this comes down truly for me to the end of their season. I have them losing to Virginia and I had them losing to Pittsburgh, both of which we were in the last five weeks of the year, I believe. So if that were to happen, that's a significant damper on your Heisman, your on your Heisman resume and could feasibly push you out of the race at the very last second, especially especially with the uh, Pittsburgh loss being the end of the year, the very last game on their schedule. So I, all told, I think that as far as teams that I don't ex- or players I don't expect to make the playoffs, I think he's got probably the true best shot. But I'm not 100% sold that with their end of year finish, because more likely than not, that means that he probably had a couple issues that cost them either the game or cost them a couple key possessions that their defense couldn't handle, things of that nature. So Tyler Van Dyke coming in at number five, right outside of my top four list, which consists of two quarterbacks, a defensive player, and a running back. We've got one more running back on the list, and we'll actually be talking about him next. It's Bijan Robinson from Texas. There's a lot to like about Texas's setup this year, um, especially considering the fact that Quinn Ewers is coming in. You've got a really good offensive line, and then you've got Bijan Robinson, who is absurd at how talented he is. He's strong. If you've watched any of his games or his highlights, he the the way that he moves 
in the way that he can just stop. Like, he could be going full speed, it feels like, and he's just, okay, I'm done. I'm going a different direction. And just everything, it's like he has gravity turned off. It is ridiculous to watch B. John Robinson play football. And with Texas rebounding, trying to find their footing, trying to be back, like we always love to say, B. John Robinson could be the key piece of them getting to seven, eight wins this year because you've got to let Quinn Ewers settle into that quarterback position, leaning run heavy, and really focusing in on you know, letting Bijan do the things and set up Quinn Ewers to open up a spot here or there or, you know, finding that happy medium is going to be crucial. I think Bijan Robinson can provide plenty of talent and provide plenty of great plays that it's more than possible. And I almost, there was a lot of debate for me on this list. I almost flipped Braylon Allen and Bijan Robinson strictly because I like where Wisconsin's at a little bit more than I like where Texas is at. But I think that, um, the general makeup of their team probably supports him a little bit better. You've got other pieces that could still leave the door open a little bit more for B. John Robinson as far as uh, backing up the front seven a little bit more because Quinn Ewers is such a talented quarterback. I don't think you get that with Graham Mertz. I also think that uh, Texas' schedule might be a little bit easier. So uh, all told, I've got him at number four, and that takes us now into the final three where we have the one and only defensive player on this list one Mr. Will Anderson. Anderson is the first defensive player since Miles Garrett that I could 100% justify taking first overall in a draft class over good quarterbacks. And I know that sounds weird and the positional value is not there, but Will Anderson is terrifying. There, I don't know that I have ever seen a more terrifying player in Alabama's uniform. Now think of what that list would entail. I've, I'm 21 years old. That means I've probably got a good 10 to 12 years of college football watching in my brain. Think about how many quality players, how many just terrifying players I've seen at Alabama. Will Anderson is at the very top of it. Maybe a little bit of that's recency bias, but the dude yeah, he just goes out there and destroys. And it's, you know, you don't see defensive players win Heisman's, which is why he's number three. I would probably call him my my best college football player of 2022. I think he's just that talented, even over some of these quarterbacks. I think pound for pound, he is the best player in college football right now. But again, defensive players don't win Heisman. Uh, a top three finish is about all you can ask for. And even that shows just how incredible he is and how truly confident I am that he'll go out there and do it all again. So we'll make that one kind of quicker because while, yes, I do think he'll be a Heisman finalist, I don't really think that there's any real chance that he wins it because there's so much talent, especially at positions that they love to lean into, like quarterback. One such example, our most recent Heisman winner, Bryce Young, same team, actually, Alabama. The thing I like so much about Young is that he he comes into a game, he's going to bring you accuracy, he's going to bring you poise, and he's just going to bring you pretty football for the entirety of the year. Every snap that he's on the field, just it looks so smooth. And there's something just so understated about that. You know, he doesn't have just the craziest arm. He's not the biggest quarterback. Uh, he's not the, just the fastest by any means. But he's a smooth operator. I mean, everything that comes out of his hands feels like it's, it's going exactly where it was meant to. And he's just... I, it's probably the best I've seen the Alabama offense run. It's not the most talented, by I, don't, I wouldn't say, and it's not the most explosive, but it feels like the most cohesive that it's been with him at quarterback, and that's a lot of that's a lot of talent. Again, it's Alabama continuously one ups themselves, and Bryce Young is one such example of that. I think he's probably uh, out of the Tua, Jalen, Mack you know, grouping of quarterbacks that we've seen really blossom at Alabama. I would say Bryce is probably the best one that's come through there so far. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, Tua and Mac right now look like they, or well, all three of them could be feasible NFL quarterbacks, but um, all told, I do think Bryce will end up being at the top of that food chain. Uh, the real reason he's number two, he, he probably should have been number one, but the only reason he's number two is that there's only ever been one player repeat as Heisman, that being Archie Griffin. So I'm going to pick the historic trend over history being made, which does unfortunately mean Bryce comes in second, or at least is a Heisman finalist to the eventual number one. I would assume you know it by now, but we're going with C.J. Stroud from the Ohio State University. 
Now it helps here. Uh, kind of something I pointed out earlier, Jackson Smith and Jigba literally let off our list. So Buckeye opens it, Buckeyes close it. Uh, they're known for great offenses, Ohio State is. C.J. Stroud is another quarterback and a great line of college quarterbacks that they've produced there. Don't want to extend that to the NFL, but while they're still in Ohio, or still at Ohio State, rather, they're, they're very, very good. Ohio State was my number two ranked team in those top 25, so you know I think they're going to be very good. C.J. Stroud going to be a giant piece of that, and ultimately what kind of Push this, and I know I mentioned Bryce's um, the fact that Heisman people don't win Heisman twice. Um, that was kind of my main reasoning for not putting him number one. But also, I think it it's not the greatest look when a team has two players there. Of course, it's awesome for the school itself and the fan base. But it, ultimately, I think that it's a little bit of a, a an issue with voters because you look at it and it's like, okay, well this team. Was has two players that are so good that they're in the Heisman finalists. Well, that means that one can't really be the most valuable player because they had another potential most valuable player on that same team. So the success kind of corresponds and correlates with one another. So I think it looks really weird when you have two guys, especially if, you, if they were to ever have one win with two guys that on that same team on the Heisman finalists because at that point, how are you voting either one of them most valuable if they're on the same team and they're really contributing to one another's success because there's no telling that if one wasn't there, the other would be as successful. So ultimately, that's kind of what creates this little situation for me and inevitably puts C.J. Stroud above, who I do think is a very good quarterback. I just don't see this working out very well for the Alabama group and maybe even your your Tyler Van Dykes or your B. John Robinsons or those little those guys who would be kind of the guy for their university really push up and they're the most realistic challengers for CJ Stroud. So what do you think of my top 10 list as a whole? Who would you switch around? Is there somebody I forgot? Is there somebody I shouldn't have had on this list at all? feel free to let me know. But for now, that is episode 21 of the From My Perspective podcast. Be sure to subscribe. And as always, I'll see you next time.